Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I know I'd rather be upstairs listening to Pavel talk about test automation, so I appreciate everyone taking time to be here. Um, yeah, this is my first time on the conference circuit. If you're all still awake when I'm done, I'll take it as a win. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Matt, I come from Imagination Technologies. Um, for the past four years, I've been working on the open source driver for our PowerVR GPUs which is very exciting. Uh, it's nice to be able to finally work on that out in the open. Um, I thought I'd start today with a literal overview of a modern DRM driver. Uh, as you might expect, the story starts with a GPU. Throughout our early development on the open source driver stack, we've been focused across a few different uh, GPU models, um, but the one we've made the most progress with so far is our AXE116M. Uh, more specifically, we've been using AM625 development boards from TI. Uh, the whole AM62 family of SOCs uses this same GPU, uh, but this dev board in particular is cheap and simple, and we have way too many of them now. <laughs> that monstrosity does serve a real purpose. Um, it's helped us run countless CTS iterations to achieve full conformance on that chip for uh, Vulkan 1.0, which is very exciting. And that's a huge step towards becoming a mature driver. Um, and we can finally use the logo. Uh, so our GP on top of that GPU sits our driver stack. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this kind of overview diagram before. I won't go into too much detail, but there's one thing I really want to point out here. Um, the user space section is specifically labeled Vulkan. This is deliberate. Um, our driver stack has been developed from the ground up to be a Vulkan driver and implement that Vulkan API. So open GLES, open GL desktop, that'll come from the Zinc layer in Mesa, which implements them on top of Vulkan, uh, as long as we implement a bunch of extra compatibility extensions, which we weren't expecting. I think that's an overview. Uh, I guess I'm done here. Um, <laughs> no. Okay, so there are two relatively new components in the DRM subsystem that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, GPU VM and the DRM scheduler. And let's start with the scheduler. Um, it's not actually that new. So I think brief history. Uh, the earliest version landed in the AMD GPU tree almost a decade ago, uh, way back in 2015, which makes me feel very old. Uh, two years later, Lucas Stack recognized the marvelous AMD GPU scheduler and worked to move it into DRM common code with an initial prototype of the Etnaviv driver already using it. Over the next two years, three new GPU drivers landed in mainline Linux, all of which made use of the DRM scheduler from the outset, with four drivers now building on top of the common code, plus AMD GPU from the outset. Uh, some deficiencies started cropping up. Um, Sima Veta noted a major one in 2021. All drivers had to hand roll their own dependency handling. Patches were sent out and soon all four drivers were using common dependency handling in the scheduler as well. So there's a great pedigree there. And it really sounds like we should be taking advantage of this framework when we're developing a new driver rather than re-implementing from scratch. And that's not just a flippant comment. Many people feel, and we agree, that it is important to add or reuse common code where appropriate in order to keep a unified ecosystem moving smoothly forwards. Having seven different implementations of a scheduler is just asking for maintainers to give up and leave. So, okay, let's get that GPU scheduler plumbed into our driver. Um, there is a snag. PowerVR GPUs have firmware, um, which they use to do scheduling directly on the GPU with little involvement from the driver stack. And that's okay. The DRM scheduler is just a framework. So if we don't need the software scheduler, we just won't use it. Um, it turns out the DRM scheduler doesn't just schedule. It does a bit more than that. It also enforces the often subtle and arcane semantics around DMA fences, which we do not want to get up to try and do it ourselves, 
I had no interest in messing it up myself. So we need to figure out how to make the DRM scheduler and our firmware scheduler play nice together. The most obvious solution would be just dumb down the firmware enough that the DRM scheduler can do its work um, without the two conflicting. This is technically possible. We could have done this. Um, the end result would be not exactly ideal. We would lose the benefits of offloading scheduling work to the firmware, um, which includes uh, reduced latency of resolving dependencies at, uh, at, like, at critical time and just lower workload on the CPU. Um, but it would mean our firmware fork diverging significantly from the proprietary driver. Um, timing was on our side here. After two RFC versions, our driver with no DRM scheduler support, Matt Brost from Intel, published an RFC uh, entitled Z DRM Scheduler and Long-Running Workload Plans, which started with this familiar sentiment. Um, <laughs> hey, that sounds pretty familiar, right? That's what we're trying to do. Um, did we miss something? Is there something there already that we could have used? Uh, uh, no, this is all brand new work that he's been working on. Their solution, as suggested by, I believe, Faith Ekstrand originally, uh, was to bind schedulers to entities one-to-one. -one. Uh, okay, back up. What's an entity? Uh, let's back up and talk briefly about the architecture of the DRM scheduler. At the time of the Z-Patch series, it, the DRM scheduler consisted of a four-layer structure. Uh, each GPU hardware queue is assigned a scheduler. Each scheduler maintains multiple run queues. Each run queue corresponds to a task priority, so ranging from kernel priority at the top, high, normal, low. The driver submits entities to queues based on priority, and each entity holds a queue of strictly ordered jobs. The glue that makes this whole layer construct uh, useful is two rules. So the first rule is an invariant. Jobs in an entity are always executed in order. The entities themselves have no direct relation to each other, but within a single entity, those jobs are guaranteed to execute sequentially. And second, a scheduling rule. These define how the entities are arranged in run queues. And essentially, there are two options. FIFO and round robin. Uh, in FIFO, the run queues are strictly ordered. Each entity has all its jobs executed in full, and then the scheduler moves on to the next. In round robin mode, the run queues are strictly unordered. Jobs are selected from each entity in turn, as you would expect from round robin. In both cases, empty entities are skipped, but for all intents and purposes, this is also an invariant because you can only configure this system-wide at runtime. So one-to-one -one relationship between schedulers and entities. All right. Other Matt's solution was a new special option, a DRM shared policy single entity, which is a mouthful. When enabled, that would eliminate the run queues entirely instead of signing a single persistent entity to each scheduler with all jobs being added to that entity. So with only one entity in play, there. excuse me, so with only one entity in play, the two rules from before allow us to ensure that all of the jobs ever submitted to that scheduler would run in the order they were submitted. So from the first, jobs in an entity already executed in order. Yep, we know that, that's easy. We've only got one entity, everything's in order. And the scheduling rule becomes irrelevant when you only have one entity to choose from because both will always choose the next job from that single entity. This really does sound like it simplifies things a lot. And in, from a consumer point of view, it does. If this was the only case, unfortunately, the implementation was kind of a mess and required putting if single entity checks all over the code for the scheduler. And it, yeah, it was a bit messy. A lot of special casing going on. So each run queue corresponds to a, a predefined, excuse me, <laughs> bear with me a second. As is often the way in the world of open source, this was not the solution that ultimately landed. 
Uh, after months of discussion and changes around that original Z patch series, uh, Lubin Twikov of AMD proposed an alternative by way of fixing one of the early limitations of the scheduler. So recall we have four run queues, that's fixed, and each run queue has a fixed priority. Lubin's change was really simple in concept, just let each driver define its own list of priorities, and crucially, each driver announces how many run queues it requires per GPU scheduler it creates. So now we have a way to frame the firmware away aware scheduler solution, whereas the introduction of DRM shed policy single entity required one large change to the DRM scheduler itself. The new solution made possible by this change from Lubin consisted of just two small steps taken by the implementing driver. Declare only one priority, which prevents the DRM scheduler from prioritizing any job over any other job. And declare only one entity. Since we only have one priority, that means we declare one entity per scheduler. And that was the other mat's original solution. So the same application of those two rules applies here. Jobs are always executed in order in an entity, and we don't have to worry about the entity arrangement because there is only one. So that is our solution for the DRM scheduler, and that is the end of our story with it. Let's switch over now uh, to the GPU VM. GPU VM was born as the GPU Virtual Address Manager, shortened to GPU VA Manager, shortened to GPU VA, uh, which just was meaningless, so it became GPU VM. The brainchild of Dan Lowe Krumrich and Dave Early, both of Red Hat, it is intended to help drivers implement user space manageable GPU virtual address spaces in reference to the Vulkan API. Now that sounds really good to us. We're a Vulkan first driver. Of course, we want something that'll help us implement the Vulkan API. Much like we talked about with the DRM scheduler, GPU VM is designed to solve a problem that most, if not all DRM drivers encounter, managing the virtual address space or spaces of a, a GPU. The first version of the GPU VM patches was sent out after our first RFC patch for the PowerVR DRM driver. So just from the patch summaries, we can see one of the benefits it gave us, uh, less code. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, other, excuse me. Oh, I've lost it. Okay, I seem to have lost the rest of my slide deck. I don't know where it's gone. Uh, so we will ad lib from here. Uh, the other benefit of the GPU Virtual Manager um, is that it can allow us to do, well, it basically provides three functionalities. It provides allocation uh, of the address space, which is not a new thing. There's already a system in the kernel to do that. But what it also does is allow, define this mechanism for mapping uh, physical memory into it. So that is primarily through the lens of GEM, the uh, Intel so original uh, memory management system, um, which we were already taking advantage of. And third, and most crucially, it allows you to perform complex operations on, that, on those two structures that are storing information about the address space and how it's mapped into hardware. And some of, those crew, some of those complex operations are very error prone and people tend to get them wrong implementing them themselves. So that's where the bulk of that code that we stripped out there came from or went away, I guess. Um, so these operations are things like splitting an address uh, range so that you can partially map or unmap. You could create a sparse binding where you have a large virtual address area and only certain parts of it need backing memory. So you would only map the bits you need. And this, all this complexity is just more information that needs to be tracked. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So GPU VM. So why are we bothering with all this? This is a lot of work, seemingly. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's, it's important to reuse code uh, where possible. And just copy pasting it into your own driver is really not the way to do that. Uh, you end up with two separate sets of problems. Someone will fix one somewhere, 
the other one doesn't get fixed, they diverge, features are added, features are removed, optimizations are added. It's just a nightmare. You don't want to be doing that. So when I say reusing code, I mean lifting code out into common library space so that multiple sections of the kernel or whatever project can take advantage of it. With the, G with the GPU scheduler, this was the path that was taken. It was lifted out of AMD and made common for everyone to access. With GPU VM, it was created from the outset as a common library, but it solved a problem that already existed uh, that, or that had already been solved by the drivers that existed at the time. I guess the idea would, mm, no. The new functionality that the GPU VM provided was something that didn't exist in any of the drivers at the point. And it backed something that NVIDIA or the Nouveau folks called VM bind, which was how all of these complex operations like sparse binding, partial mapping, were exposed to user space to allow Vulkan to take advantage of them. And I guess they looked at the existing solutions and went, none of these are good enough, let's do something better, and then everyone can use it. And that's where we are. We have this fantastic memory manager. We were involved in the development. As I said, our first patch went out right before this came out, but our later versions came out after. So while GPU VM went through seven or eight patch iterations, and our driver went through more, um, we were able to test, review, and suggest changes to the GPU VM code as it was evolving, um, and then keep our driver updated with it. Which brings me to one of the problems we had. When developing against bleeding edge features, like these new strategies added to the DRM scheduler or the GPU VM code, you're working against patches. You're not working against a Git tree. And that can be pretty frustrating. Not just from a tooling perspective, there are scripts, there are tools that can fix this or make it easier to work with patches. That's fine. The problem is the moving target. GPU VM, as I said, went through seven or eight revisions. The DRM scheduler changes went through, well, there were a lot of changes. It was around for 10 years, but the changes to do with the firmware um, were happening in, at the same time as we needed to use them. So as those patches are reviewed, changed, updated, bugs fixed in them, we had to keep up with that. And often that meant API surfaces changing significantly between releases. So the major challenge with keeping uh, using modern, like really modern bleeding edge library code, common code, is <laughs> keeping up with it. So is it worth it? Should we just not use the new stuff, let someone else deal with it first and use it five years, 10 years down the line once it's mature and, and the standard already? Well, someone's gotta go first. Someone's gotta deal with it. And if no one's using the common code, It'll never get tested, and then it'll never get landed. There's no reason to have it. You've got a chicken egg problem. So it is important for someone, ideally everyone, to get on board at the start. And that is how we drive these things forward, by using the new features as they come available and interacting with the people creating them, adding your use case. Um, this is something that I heard mentioned in, a, in an unconference yesterday is that the more consumers of common code you have, the more edge cases become core use cases. And edge cases are notoriously painful to test, but if you have multiple sets of use cases using the same code, you have more ways to test that code, you have less ways to get it wrong. So it's important to use common code, it's important to use new common code, and it's important to create common code. We haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, but that doesn't mean we won't. Um, there's a long way to go before our kernel driver is complete, whatever that means. I'm sure it will never be complete. We'll always be adding things to it, adding functionality, or bring up for new devices. And hopefully along the way, we will get a chance to contribute back what we've taken from the community. So we will hopefully be able to do our own something, DRM scheduler, GPU VM, who knows what the future holds.
Um, but it is exciting. And hopefully <laughs> everyone will work together on these projects uh, and we can keep moving DRM forward. That's about all I have to say. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess questions? Yep. There you go. I guess following off the theme of scheduling being moved into the firmware, do yes. you foresee more and more of like driver functionality being moved onto the firmware side? And where it's like usually closed source. And I guess like a second part of the question is, do you see like a viable future where like open source GPU or GPU firmware becomes somewhat common? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna back up and answer a separate question that you didn't actually ask first. Um, but we are not the only people anymore who do scheduling in firmware. That seems to be the future, the Z driver that I mentioned earlier. Um, all of that new Intel stuff is doing scheduling on firmware. ARM is moving towards it with their newer chipsets. Um, it's, uh, it's not going away. Uh, the benefits of doing scheduling on the firmware are that low latency I talked about. Um, you can resolve fences and dependencies between jobs directly there without going back and forth between the kernel and the hardware. So I think there is always a compelling reason to do that there. In terms of moving other functionality in, I'm not sure what you would be able to move in to firmware. Um, the scheduler is a fairly obvious one uh, because of that latency, but at the, the, by the time you've moved that in, you essentially just have work being thrown at the GPU, and that's, that's the only operation you need to do really with it. So the future of firmware, um, personally, I think it would be great to have open source firmware. Um, that is not my call. <laughs> um, the future of open source firmware, I think someone's gonna have to take the first step. I don't know if that's gonna be us. It could be someone else, but I think once at least one company does it, then maybe others will follow. But there could be a lot of secrets revealed. I don't really know much about our firmware. Um, I've never worked on it, but um, it's entirely possible that there's stuff in there that companies would consider proprietary and, and too private to share. So I don't, maybe you'd get a simpler firmware, maybe one without the scheduler uh, and rely on the DRM scheduler to do the scheduling properly. I don't know what that looks like, sorry. Can you pass it back? I guess one of the concerns with closed source firmware is if the firmware is the one programming the MMUs and responsible for containment of what the GPU can and can't access, mm -hmm. then that, that, that closed source firmware is a little scarier. If, if there's somebody else that the kernel is, is um, supervising an MMU that he has control over, and so the GPU is contained, mm -hmm. then it's a little less scary. What, what's your architecture there? Uh, regarding the MMU. So that's controlled directly from the kernel. The kernel. Um, it's the, uh, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so it's a, a shared memory area uh, where you program effectively, I believe ours is a three layer page table, um, and it operates just like your CPU page table uh, where the CPU is setting everything up and the GPU reserves small sections of that memory uh, for firmware operations because of course the firmware needs some memory to function uh, but for the most part all of that has to be allocated by the CPU and then the firmware is told which bits it can use so it, it is very much kept in a box okay great thanks mm -hmm. Uh, say you wanted to do like GPU development for, I don't know, some Pine64 board or something. Yep. Like what's the basic hardware setup you use for that? Like do you really need like a stack of like 15 No, no, no. no. That's, and... So the Vulkan conformance test suite is enormous. There are millions of test cases. So we split it up across as many devices as we can every time we run it so that the developers on the team can get quicker results back. Um, it's also a very complicated conformance test suite. 
Um, things intermingle, the tests don't necessarily just test the thing they say, so it's very easy to break tests that seem completely unrelated, so you do need to run the whole thing over and over again. Um, for the first two years of our work on this project, I would say, we didn't touch CTS. Uh, we focused on getting a really simple Vulkan demo up, uh, and the Sasha Willems demos, um, which became, I believe, the Kronos official demos now. Um, those are great. There's some really simple stuff in there, and you can exp you, you can see exactly which Vulkan calls are being made. Um, so that's a great way to do startup development uh, on a GPU driver is to try and run simple examples. Um, there are some simple bits of CTS, but the overhead is just enormous. It's a huge pain. Uh, yeah, so sim simple demos. Um, you only need your one device. You don't need lots. Um, if it's a new GPU that no one's written an open source driver on before, you may have difficulty. You need a fair amount of information about it. It's a complex beast. It's like programming a CPU. Um, you know, it wouldn't be possible without the huge data sheets from ARM, from Intel. Um, so you're kind of at the mercy of companies to provide that information. Um, and then with firmware becoming more prevalent, you need the blob from somewhere. In our case, the firmware blobs that the open source driver uses are subtly different from the ones from the proprietary driver. So even if you get hold of a leaked copy of one of those from somewhere, it's not going to help you, I'm afraid. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, up there. Thank you. Hey, uh, hey. I had two questions. Thank you, Great. first of all, but I had two questions. Okay. Um, the first one is, uh, there was some news lately about like AMD not open sourcing firmware, but entertaining open sourcing the documentation for that firmware. I was just wondering if you I I haven't heard about that. That would be really cool. Yeah, there is. Um, a... AMD are quite big in the open source space. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of the developers on it, I mentioned a couple of them in the talk, right? Um, having open source documentation for the firmware interface is one of those crucial bits that you need uh, for writing a driver. Um, it's just as important as having hardware documentation, right? Because if you know what registers to write into, for example, you can program the hardware, but you can't interact with the firmware without knowing what the ABI looks like there. Um, so yeah, that's that's really cool if they're actually doing that. Uh, the other question was apart from GPU VM mm -hmm. and the uh, DRM scheduler infrastructure. Yep. I was wondering uh, what other common uh, infrastructure patterns there are. I heard that Faith Eric's mm -hmm. grad is looking to make like a common infrastructure for Vulkan, at least Mesa, I think like Mesa UMDs. Yes. I was wondering if there was a similar track for DRM in other spaces. Like what other? Okay. So the story in user space is much, I don't want to say simpler, it's still complicated writing a Vulkan driver, but it's more straightforward to see how code could be made common. In the kernel, you're interacting with wildly different hardware um, that behaves in very different ways often. Um, that's tending to be less true now that uh, you've got more low-level APIs, DirectX 12, Vulkan, uh, and newer hardware is being designed around those APIs, and the APIs are designed around the hardware. So you have more commonality now, which is why scheduler, GPU, VM are now possible to be common. In user space, uh, the current, I don't work on the user space, I only work on the kernel bit, but from what I understand, the current state of the Vulkan common code in Mesa is it's more of a toolkit that drivers can opt into bits that they need and want to reuse. Uh, rather than a framework that the drivers sit in. Um, there is talk uh, from Faith about flipping that upside down. Um, that is how, um, I forget what it's called, the, the layer that Zinc sits on on top of Vulkan, um, there's a, a compatibility layer in the middle there, uh, which is a custom API that exists only in Mesa, and it allows front ends to talk to back ends uh, so you have a GL API, you have a GLES, you have a, a WebGL, a, a whatever other APIs you need. Translation layer? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the concern with moving Vulkan to that kind of model, uh, where you have a, a framework that provides the Vulkan, all the runtime details, um, is that you'd effectively have to re-implement Vulkan as a compatibility layer on top of that. 
and then mm. what's the point, right? You're not actually gaining anything. You're just creating a new complicated API. So I think the current state of uh, Mesa with a Vulkan runtime that is opt-in is good. Um, obviously, the more you opt into it, the better. I've already advocated for reusing common code, um, but it's it's got to be up to the drivers because some stuff just doesn't make sense for everyone. So with DRM, it's a little bit harder to create that. In the kernel, yes, it's yeah. absolutely, yeah. 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 The UAPIs can be made somewhat similar, uh, that bridge to, to user space, but um, there's still, like there is common DRM UAPI IOCTLs, um, but not all of them can be made common. There's always going to be device specific stuff that you need. Okay. And I think if you try to make it all common, you just end up reinventing the concept of IOCTLs inside IOCTLs, which again, seems a bit pointless. Oh my. Come on, take up, take up the Slack, people. <laughs> I guess I'm interested in your career development and like how you end up working on GPU drivers. It seems it's interesting to me. Um, it's where I started. <laughs> um, I came, yeah, that's it, day one. Um, no, I came out of uni and I went straight into imagination. I was the first person brought onto the open source project. Um, so it was kind of a really unique position available at the time. Uh, to work on an open source project at a company where I could get a stable job out of it as well. Uh, it was kind of too good to be <laughs> to turn up. Um, and, and the fact that it was on a GPU driver was, okay, great, I can learn this. <laughs> I can figure out what I'm doing here. Um, I started out on the kernel side. We brought more senior people on for the kernel side. I did a bit of work on the Mesa side while they did all the hard stuff that I didn't understand. Um, and now I'm back on the kernel side. Um, yeah, so I've kind of seen a lot of the driver stack. It's been a steep learning curve, that's for sure. Uh, I still don't understand a huge chunk of how Vulkan works, um, but you don't need to understand everything, right? That's why you have a team around you. Um, so now that you have like Vulkan 1.0 compliance, yes. Uh, what's the future plans? Like, is the plan to uh, complete Vulkan 1.1 or like support other GPU cores? So I've been told I'm not allowed to talk about our roadmap. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. All right. Basically, there's a lot we want to do, right? And we can't do it all at once because we are a small team. There's only five or six of us. Um, uh, the, uh, there's this sort of fantasy from companies about open source that means, oh, you can just get the community to do it. But no, someone's got to do the work and it's the people who work for the company that are going to end up doing the work, right? So we're going to be the ones doing uh, most of the work towards 1.1, 1.2, or new hardware, or whatever. Um, what I'll say is we have released a handful of firmware binaries for other platforms, uh, so it's not just this one. Um, We've also released the, the device info uh, for those platforms. So uh, list of features, hardware features, um, and lists of errata, which errata apply to them. Uh, that all exists in a branch in our GitLab repository for Mesa. So with that information, it is possible to bring up those devices, provided the features support exists, um, which it does for most of it, as far as I'm aware. And yeah, so I mentioned at the beginning Zinc um, being used to support GL desktop and GLES. Um, we're not there yet. We are working on it, um, that I will say, um, because we are missing some of the extensions. It's Vulkan 1.0 plus a handful of extensions that make Vulkan behave more like OpenGL. Um, yeah, it's controversial that way that was done, but uh, yeah, that's, that's about all I can share. Yep. How's your performance for the closed source versus the open source driver? We don't have performance numbers yet. We haven't really been, like obviously we're thinking about performance in the back of our minds while we're writing code. We're not just doing everything in, in like uh, ON cube time or something, but it's, uh, it's not our priority right now. Our priority is feature completeness, trying to get everything working at all. And then we can go back and, and 
really focus on, pro on, on performance numbers later. Um, I don't expect that it's on par at the moment, honestly. But um, that doesn't have to be the case forever, right? It'll, it'll improve. Thanks. Uh, so I guess on that vein, what <laughs> was the motivation for writing an open source driver in the first place if you say that you know employees of mm -hmm. that imagination are still writing mm -hmm. said driver what's the motivation for making it open source what was the driving factor for that so even if it's not open source we still have to work with the kernel so we still have to write a kernel module it just is an outer tree kernel module or an in tree kernel module on a fork something like that and we still have to do user space um, Part of it is just not wanting to do everything ourselves in-house. Um, people have already done things, they've already done them well, why can't we take advantage of that? And that's kind of the selfish view of it, right? It's, uh, it, it, it just makes good business sense to reuse code that exists. Um, my manager started uh, pushing for this project for years um, and he really wanted to get this off the ground. And um, it wasn't until the, the, the driving factor essentially became, we want to take advantage of new features. We need to be closer to the development. We need to be upstream, we mm -hmm. need to be in tree. Um, and that eventually became our motivation, or that was the business motivation, because we did have to convince. Yeah, they're, not, they're not just gonna do it out of the goodness Please. of their hearts, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the approach that they took. Yeah. I was just contrasting to NVIDIA and their proprietary drivers. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got more. Yeah, you're keeping it going. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I, I kind of missed the fact that it was a closed source driver and then you wrote an open source version. Yeah, so we've, it's kind of been a historical thing in the community that Power VR drivers were never open source. Um, in a lot of cases, the drivers were, the open source drivers in Mesa and DRM were written by community. They weren't, they didn't come out of the companies that created the hardware. Mm. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that, uh, but for the most part, uh, they're reverse engineered efforts or they're done from docs released by the companies, but they didn't want to do the work. Um, so it's really nice for us to be able to be an exception there. Um, it's had some interesting challenges, um, mostly around licensing. Uh, we're looking at the proprietary code all day long. It's like, how do you uh, firewall it? And we basically did, we had to firewall it. Um, so the code that we've upstreamed is all written from scratch. It's not just cut and paste from our proprietary driver. You can kind of see that um, a few years ago, we released the source code for one of our earliest drive, graphics drivers, um, just out of historical curiosity, I think. Um, so you can see they're, very, they're fundamentally quite different. Um, and it was a good, you know, it's a good opportunity to get a clean break uh, and, and start from scratch and build on, on what everyone else has been working on in the meantime. Can you talk a bit about like what the firewall process looks like? Um, probably not. <laughs> I will probably get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's one behind you there. Is there any plan to um, go and do functional safety with graphics? Okay. Um, uh, is there any plan to go and do functional safety compliance with your graphics driver? Yeah. Um, the proprietary driver is available for Vulcan Safety Critical. Open source. I know. I'm getting there. <laughs> the, the, the proprietary one is available for Safety Critical. Um, as far as I know, nothing in DRM or Mesa is built for functional safety. Um, there are no open source Vulcan SC drivers that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's probably not the answer you want to hear. <laughs> Okay, should we leave Thank it there? You. Yep, all right.